As a farmer in a former Soviet Republic, Velu Eansalu has grown accustomed to change. His late father secured the farm when the communist system of collective farming was abolished in Estonia and replaced with a completely free, unsubsidized market. But 12 years ago, Estonia exported 40% of its agricultural produce, and now it is a net importer. The country's cattle population has dropped by 90%, and one quarter of agricultural land is not farmed. There is no dairy collective here, and no milk bottling plant, so Velu is forced to sell his milk door to door in a nearby town. It's been a long, hard struggle and a very steep learning curve. So far, at least, he's winning the race against big factory farms and cheap, subsidized imports from abroad. Well, first of all, the major problem was the restitution of land. At the beginning of private farming, Everything was strange no, for us. Oli kõik võõras. Me ei teadnud üldse, meil puudus, uh, vana, puudusid vana We did not know, or we lacked the tradition, of what endast, private farming uh, meant. Talupidamine kui selline. Uh, sest we only had large collective ju, farms until me then. Ainult, uh, soohosid, to keep his farm viable, the Velo has begun producing cheese and yogurt, which he sells directly to hotels. He's ready to join the European Union in that his facilities meet the hygiene standards required in Western Europe. But even after Estonia joins the so-called Free Trade Association, he'll not be allowed to export to the West. There are other expensive regulations that he can't comply with. It's one small example of how Brussels appears to be setting up a two-tier Europe designed to hasten the development of massive factory farms. Velo has no time for bigger Western producers who want their subsidies maintained after expansion. Unfortunately, in the case of competition, each entrepreneur must survive in difficult circumstances. They should either find an additional farming branch or just quit if it does not pay off anymore. Vino runs a mixed farm. He produces fodder for his own cows and a surplus to trade with a local company for fertilizer. Barter helps when money is tight. He's also experimenting with new products for Estonia. <laughs> this is one of the most northerly fields of maize in the world. Velo hopes to sell it to other farmers as quality livestock feed. But not all farmers have such options. Across Estonia and the other nine relatively poor nations trying to join the EU, fear has gripped the owners of family farms. On this day, Velo and other local farmers have been given the chance of questioning their prime minister. Traveling the country in early election campaigning, Prime Minister Siim Kalas is trying to calm his farming electorate. But he's in no real position to tell them how their lives will change. Negotiations are underway with the European Union, but nobody knows if the EU's infamous common agricultural policy subsidies will be extended to Eastern Europeans. Nor do they know if the policy will be reformed to let them export more produce to the West. There will be certain inequality. So if, if the situation which is proposed, that the subsidies, uh, uh, which uh, will be released to European uh, new candidate countries, the candidate countries, will be, they, they will be lower. Uh, than, than the subsidies uh, for member countries, it's of course unfair and it's unequal treatment. But uh, from Estonian um, side, we are more interested in uh, uh, reforming of common agricultural policy. 
then the, the, the actually the fighting for the maintaining the same system and uh, fighting for getting more subsidies for from this system. Prime Minister Kalas acknowledges that integration may result in more large farms, often owned by foreign companies. But he says bigger is better. The market must be based on the efficient production, no doubt. And, uh, 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 but as everywhere, the small farmers uh, have a lot of uh, big number of people, so also electorate is substantial. Uh, and um, I, I mean that, uh, that uh, this desire to, to have, um, to divide li lines, this desire in some circles exists, no? From our side, with our small uh, countries' uh, capabilities, we will fight for free market and efficient production. Many small farms remain in parts of Western Europe, and here in France, subsidies have become a way of life. French farmers are the biggest beneficiaries of the EU's agriculture budget. But changes to the common agricultural policy mean subsidies are now paid proportionate to the size of a farm. This new approach, designed to combat Europe's chronic overproduction in some sectors, also favors the big company-owned farms. François Dufour is the deputy head of the French Farmers Association. He wants to stop the European overproduction. He also wants small French farms protected in the process. In the West, we wish to see a ceiling on subsidies. That's a limit to aid per farm that takes into account the number of jobs in the region. We want to limit these subsidies to stop large holdings from continuing to grow and create more overproduction. The gain from this limitation would allow us to re-inject some money into small and medium holdings to support their activities and compensate the income of small and medium farmers in the East. Bernard Joubin's farm equipment is more modern than that generally found in Estonia, and he's able to sell his milk directly to a processing factory. But his farm is small, and the subsidies from the EU are down to a level which makes no real difference to his income. Unlike the growing number of large company-owned farms, which are found in other parts of the country and are given millions of euros. It seems small farmers in Eastern and Western Europe have a lot more in common than they might think. All feel threatened by what seems to be a massive restructuring of European agriculture. We are a bit worried, worried for our income and worried about the number of farmers. There are different types of agriculture, an agriculture with very large holdings and huge means of production, and alongside that, an agriculture less important in size. So for me, personally, I ask myself the question, will we still be needed tomorrow? If European Union expansion and subsidy changes, do result in big farms taking over in both East and West, Bernard Joubin says all small farmers will suffer. He says more big, heavily subsidized farms can only lead to further overproduction, which will badly affect everyone. I think we shall be in an environment of overproduction in Europe. And with overproduction, he would say, costs will fall. Sorry, uh, prices will fall, enfin, without necessarily a lowering of costs, which is why we are worried about, about the future, not only ours, but also the future of those who will join. It's not a good time to be a smallholder in Europe. As politicians rush to finalize negotiations on pan-European agriculture policy, family farmers are left to wonder if they'll still be in business in a few years' time.